ces coupures possibles aux États-Unis? Je crois que la réponse... Euh... Uh, I could give the first, oh, oui, yes, c'est um, The question was uh, whether Minister McKay is concerned about the F-35 uh, program because of possible cuts in the United States. Je crois que le ministre Panetta a juste euh, clarifié l'intention pour euh, les, les coupes de, de bougettes dans les États-Unis. Euh, avec euh, votre question spécifique, euh, le programme de F-35, c'est l'intention du Canada de procéder avec euh, ce processus, ce euh, procurement, euh, comme les États-Unis. Euh, il y a les pressions, c'est évident. Mais pour cet euh, euh, asset militaire, c'est absolument crucial pour la protection de l'Amérique du Nord. Donc, on avait euh, beaucoup de confiance avec notre investissement maintenant et au futur pour la nécessité de continuer ce programme. C'est clair, les États-Unis euh, avaient l'intention aussi de procéder avec euh, ce processus-là. Euh, donc, euh, le Canada avait euh, beaucoup de contacts avec la compagnie euh, Lockheed Martin et notre partenaire. Et le partenaire est, est plus de juste le Canada et les États-Unis, c'est neuf partenaires dans ce consortium. Avez-vous un plan B si jamais uh, euh, les États-Unis… Excusez-moi. Sorry. Um, Minister McKay was just saying that uh, Minister Panetta had clarified the situation with respect to the U.S.'s intent to make uh, budget cuts to the defense budget. Uh, with respect to your specific question, Canada's intention is to proceed with the procurement process. Of course, there are pressures, uh, but we believe this is an absolutely critical military asset for the protection of North America. We're very confident about uh, the future of the program, and we believe it's absolutely necessary to keep it uh, in place. And, of course, the U.S. also intends to continue the process. And there are agreements uh, not only with Lockheed Mark Martin, but with nine other partners. I'm Jack Julian with CBC News, and I have a joint question. Uh, Defense Secretary Panetta, you said that you're committed to the F-35 program, but I want to know, do you think you'll be able to get funding for it? And my, my backup question, or my second question for Peter McKay, is if the uh, program, if there are funding problems in the, the program founders because of financial difficulties, what's Canada's backup plan? Uh, on the first part of that, uh, yes, I, I feel very confident that, uh, that we'll get uh, funding for the F-35 F30, F30, F30 program. This, this is the fighter plane for the future, and in some ways we really have no alternative. This is the plane that is going to be able to uh, provide the technology, the capabilities for the future. We need to have this. It's true for us. It's true for our partners, uh, not only the Canadians but others who are going to uh, work with us and participate with us uh, in the development of the, uh, of the F-35. Uh, you know, let me, let me say that uh, as we go through uh, the budget decisions that we have to make, uh, obviously, uh, as I said, there are areas where we will look for savings. We're looking at procurement reform. We're looking at other areas. But we also have to look at areas where we continue to invest in the future. And the F-35 is one of those areas where we are going to continue to invest in the future. Given those uh, comments, uh, and those are comments that are very much in line with uh, the discussion uh, Defense Secretary Panetta and I had uh, some two months ago at the Pentagon, that uh, the United States' commitment to this program is firm, is fast. This is uh, uh, the very reason that Canada has chosen this aircraft. It's because of the eye-watering technology aboard the F-35. It's the ability to dominate and own the airspace over continental North America. Uh, there is no fifth generation aircraft other than the F-35 available to Canada and the United States. Uh, so all of the hypothetical discussions and, uh, and quite negative discussions, quite frankly, about this program uh, are really just clatter and noise. This program is going ahead. Uh, clearly, budgetary pressures uh, are going to lead to speculation. We are dealing with our budgets, as all countries are dealing with its budget, but we are not wavering on our commitment to this program. 
There are pillars within every defense department. This is one of those pillars, having the ability to protect your sovereignty. And there is a direct link, a direct link between our national sovereignty and our ability to protect our airspace, our commitments through NORAD, uh, our NATO commitments. And, and let me refresh everyone's memory again about how Canada played such a critical role in the success of the Libya mission because of fighter aircraft, because of interoperability of aircraft. And these planes, literally, and, and look, I'm no engineer, but they, they have increased capacity to communicate and literally talk to one another. The stealth capability and the many other features of that aircraft are what make it such an important part of the North American protection uh, and our ability to, uh, to reach out and contribute internationally, as we saw recently uh, in Libya and as we are continuing to see uh, in missions like Afghanistan. NATO countries, other NATO countries, quite frankly, are looking at this aircraft as well. And we have a group that are clearly already committed, including the United Kingdom, uh, including uh, Australia and others. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll, we only have time for two more questions, and I see Canadian Press and uh, Wall Street Journal there, so proceed. Secretary Panetta, uh, there's been some rumblings that you're not happy with the size of Canada's purchase, that you don't believe that 65 or 66 planes are enough to cover our airspace under our, uh, under our uh, defense agreements. Uh, is there any, tr any truth to that? No, not, that's, that's just not true. Uh, this is, Canada has to make uh, decisions as to uh, what it believes are necessary, and uh, I trust the ability of Canada and the minister to make the right decisions as to what they need, and we'll support that. Thank you. Uh, Adam Entis with The Wall Street Journal. A question for both of you on Afghanistan. Uh, we know, the, min we know the, the NATO meeting coming up in May in Chicago, and you're looking to kind of lay out what the transition will look like. Uh, General Amos uh, of the Marines is quoted in an interview today saying that, the, that he's confident that we'll be able to shift from a, a full counterinsurgency there to a, a train and assist uh, mission uh, within 12 months. And I wanted to ask whether that's a feasible time frame. Are we going to be able to shift from a, from a coin to a, to a train and assist? Yeah, yeah I, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with what uh, General Amos may, may or may not have said, but uh, our, our commitment uh, is to uh, implement the agreement at Lisbon. Uh, and the agreement at Lisbon is to uh, continue to work uh, towards uh, the ability to uh, reduce our combat presence by the end of uh, 2014. Uh, and obviously, uh, we are going to go through uh, the, you know, the campaign that uh, General Allen will outline as we approach uh, that, uh, that commitment. Uh, it's, uh, you know, there's no question there is going to be, as we develop uh, our ability to secure that country, to weaken the Taliban, to get the Afghan uh, army and police in place, uh, that there is going to be a transition here that takes place. As a matter of fact, uh, I will tell you that, uh, you know, we're going we're to complete another tranche of, uh, of provinces that will uh, go to the Afghans for security and governance. Uh, we've already completed one group. Uh, earlier this year. Uh, they're going well. Uh, we'll complete another tranche uh, hopefully in December. Uh, that will represent, by the way, over 50 percent of the Afghan population uh, that will be involved uh, now in these uh, transitions. So we're moving in the right direction. Uh, and as we do that, obviously, we're trying to get the Afghan army, the Afghan police to uh, assume more of the responsibilities with regards to uh, combat operations. But this is going to take a transition period, and I would, I would not uh, assign a particular date uh, or time frame for that. Uh, that's going to depend an awful lot on General Allen and, his, and working with ISAF to determine uh, how best to make the transition from a combat role to an advise and assist role. But uh, there have been no decisions regarding a time frame at this point. I just returned from Afghanistan uh, just under a week ago. Uh, met with General Allen, the uh, commander ISAF. Canada has assumed a very prominent role on that training. And uh, you'll recall that NATO has made and the Secretary General have made some very clear pronouncements with respect to training and the transition to training that is well underway. We are significantly down the road from where we were even a year ago. Uh, to that extent, uh, 
the numbers of the Afghan National Security Force, both police and military, have swelled to over 300,000. The, the focus is now on professionalizing and enabling those forces uh, to give them that, that firm backing that they need to start conducting independent operations, taking over the control of various provinces, which is done in a, in a staged fashion. Secretary Panetta has said we're, we're at the 50-plus mark now. Uh, there is a desire, in fact, and I would suggest it's happening, to meet and exceed timelines. Whether we'll get there is going to depend on this uh, very focused effort uh, to train Afghan security forces. And within that training, Lexicon uh, is improving literacy, uh, is giving them all of the skills that they need and impart those skills by American and Canadian soldiers and implant them firmly uh, in the background and, and in the training cycle uh, of Afghan security forces. And it's happening. Um, I'm proud of Canada's role. Uh, Major General Mike Day and before him General Stu Beer uh, worked very closely with that Afghan training mission uh, to see that this uh, enabling and empowerment of security forces uh, is going to hold. And that, that will be the key uh, so that they can secure their own borders, uh, provide security for their own villages and population, and, uh, and carry on well into the future. And uh, Canada has a lot to bring to this effort. Many of the soldiers who are taking part in this training mission have combat experience where they had deployed on previous missions into the south, into Kandahar province, where uh, I say with a great deal of, of, of pride and appreciation to our forces, they held the fort in the most difficult part of the country at the most critical time. And the Afghans have been very quick to acknowledge that in meeting with uh, Minister Wardak and Minister Mohammadi, their interior minister last week, um, there was a very clear uh, demonstration of appreciation on their part for what Canada has done. And so we're there partnering with uh, our greatest ally, the United States, working with our NATO allies. We're talking, uh, you know, 40 plus countries that are still involved in this effort. It's a monumental effort. But when you consider where Afghanistan is today compared to just a, sh a few short years ago. Security is, of course, the most critical piece. But when you look at the number of children now attending school, uh, the number of children that have been immunized, the infrastructure investments, uh, the long-term vision that all of these countries that we're working with and the Afghans themselves have demonstrated uh, to stabilize, uh, to be in a position uh, to ever, ever fall under the control of a terrorist organization like the Taliban. Uh, we have made enormous steps in that regard. You know, they have more women sitting in the Parliament of Afghanistan today per capita than we have in our own country. Uh, women are not only participating in elections, they're being elected. They're participating in, in business and entrepreneurial ventures. Uh, there is commerce starting to take hold in the country. They're moving back to an agrarian uh, society that uh, exports more than just poppy that winds up in, in the form of drugs on the streets of North America. They're now uh, growing beets and barley and pomegranate. So none of that can happen without security. We're all very much seized with the importance of uh, the continued training mission and the continued security building. Uh, but uh, there, is, uh, there is great progress and, and positive progress to report in that country today. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.